This is a geek leader. Hey guys, welcome to episode 171 of Geek Leader Podcast. I'm your host, John Rauda, and let's talk about Rust. If you're not familiar with Rust, Rust is a programming language that is used all over the place from game development to aerospace engineering. It is built to be extremely reliable, extremely efficient software. And if you want to learn more about Rust, there is a free one-day conference on September 15th. So it is at the Live at Manning Conference, and you can check it out. It's a full day where it goes all the way from how to learn Rust, what is it about, how to use it, what are some applications for it, where, where does it work the best. I mean, we're talking about from game development, aerospace engineering, and everything in between. So you can learn more about Rust and attend this free one-day conference uh, on September 15th, starting at 12 o'clock to 5 o'clock uh, Eastern Time. Go to geekleader.com slash rust. Again, that's geekleader.com slash rust to learn more. All right, Geek Leaders, today on the show, I've got Jeff Tun. And you may remember him from a previous episode of the Geek Leader podcast where we talked about how to um, how to become a better leader, how to amplify uh, some of your leadership skills. Today, we're going to be talking about amplifying your job search and some of the things that have happened along with COVID and how we can... Uh, how we can continue to move forward in our careers, how we can hire people, how we can look for a job if we need to, if we were impacted financially through COVID. Um, but we talked about in the past, you know, how to bring more value to your, to your workplace and how to amplify that. We're going to be talking more about that um, on this episode. So Jeff, welcome back to the show. Hey, John, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you having me back on the program. Uh, if you don't mind for anybody that didn't hear that first episode, tell, tell people kind of like what your career path has been like, kind of what you've gone through and what you're doing today. Absolutely. So I, I started my career in technology uh, as a programmer, a coder, uh, back in the COBOL CICS days. Uh, for those of you uh, uh, ancient enough to remember those those times with punch cards and uh, JCL and such, and spent a good portion of my early career at programming in a wide variety of different industries, uh, uh, financial, um, consumer electronics, and uh, about, uh, gosh, probably 20 years ago, maybe a little bit longer ago than that, I decided to make the switch into management. Um, as many of your listeners know, sometimes you have to make that choice to switch from a, a technical uh, path to a management path. And I selected the management path and uh, have done that for uh, the remainder of my career. Uh, a couple of stops as CIO for a couple of organizations. Uh, I'm located in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, and so I, I was uh, CIO for a commercial real estate developer here in town for about five years, and then was CIO for the Goodwill organization uh, here in central Indiana for about five years. And then I like to joke and say I went to the dark side and became a vendor. Uh, moving to the other side of the desk uh, and joined a cloud company. Uh, at the time, we were called Blue Lock. Our specialty was uh, disaster recovery as a service and infrastructure as a service. And I joined as the product executive uh, responsible for driving the, the vision of the, the product lines. We were acquired about two and a half years ago by a strategic service provider out of uh, Santa Clara, California and St. Louis, uh, dual headquarters by the name of Intervision Systems. And I remained with them for another couple of years, again, helping to drive product. And just recently left, uh, back in March, left there to uh, really devote myself full time to uh, my writing and speaking about leadership, specifically about IT leadership. And so I've been building that practice out for the last several months. Awesome. Um was it a tough decision to leave or was it kind of one of the things you thought this is definitely the right thing I need to do right now? You know, it it's, was something that I was thinking about for a while. Uh, I was calling it my encore career. Uh, another friend of mine uh, would call it, uh, I was on the back nine of my career because I've been doing this uh, so long and really thought about doing this uh, in retirement. But uh, with everything that was going on, with the industry, the, everything that was going on with the pandemic, 
uh, decided that now was the time to make this move and it uh, it could not wor have worked out any better. It's mm -hmm. been a fantastic decision. Um, it, uh, I, I miss some of the people back at the company, but you know, I'm, I'm blessed in that I still do, uh, consulting work, uh, for InterVision. I still host, uh, our podcast status go and John, I know you were on our program mm -hmm. uh, a few months ago. So I still do that. I host webinars, uh, so still involved quite a bit with InterVision. Awesome. And one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I was, I really liked about your first book amplify your value was that uh, you know it kind of talks about how to take that next step and how to improve what you're offering to, to folks and and the fact that we talk about it being you being you know offering value is one of the things that a lot of you know you know students that i have that graduate get their first job they don't realize that they're you know it, it's a trade right you, you have yeah. to provide value <laughs> for money it's not like a, that's a, right a give me right and uh, we, we have to talk about it in that way and you know, with COVID and, you know, lots of things happening where people are changing roles, there's new positions, there's, you know, changing your, your work habits and having to work from home or, um, you know, do more virtual meetings versus in person. And I know it's like for me, you know, conferences were kind of a big thing where, you know, going to conferences right. and now it's all virtual. I've been asked to speak at a couple of virtual ones and I just, I haven't, I haven't accepted because I, I just don't know how that's, um, how I fit in with that. Cause I, I like mm -hmm. the, the energy of the crowd. I feed in off that. And I just don't know if I'll be any good without. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, so. it, it's, it's strange. It, I've, I've done a couple of them and it is, it, it's, it's hard because you don't, you don't get that energy from the audience. It's like talking to an empty room. Uh, and uh, so it is, it is difficult. You're right. You're right. Yeah. And I, I've done, um, you know, I've been teaching for 15 years. I've done some online classes and some in the classroom classes, but this will be my first time where I'm actually lecturing through zoom. You know, usually it's just like I record myself and put it on there and it's not, it's no big deal, but this will be, you know, some, some more real things. And I guess we're all trying to figure out where we fit in that and what kind of new values we can bring and what do we, what do we have to compensate for a little bit? Yeah. Um, yeah. So what have you seen as people go through this? What, what are some of the, the folks that you're, you're helping out or working with uh, as far as what's the market like for new jobs or for careers? Well, you know, John, there's been a huge impact to our economy uh, caused by the pandemic and the, and the shutdown to try to control the, the pandemic. And um, I forget what the, the exact numbers are, but there's something like uh, 16 million people uh, out of work, uh, 10 million lost jobs since, since February. Uh, technology's been uh, blessed, I guess, in, in some ways is that it hasn't impacted technology as hard as some of the other uh, sectors in our economy. But even when you look at, at technology, unemployment in tech back at the beginning of the year was pretty close to zero. Uh, it was really low numbers. Uh, and now we're up, I think I saw a number uh, somewhere in the range of three and a half to 4%. So that's still a lot of people that have been impacted. And, and I don't think we're done yet. I think one of the things that we're gonna see here in Q3 and Q4 is companies will, uh, there may be some additional uh, reductions in force that happen. Uh, I think you'll see uh, some of that still occurring as we near the end of the year and people are realizing that they're not coming anywhere near their revenue projections for the year. I, I also think that we're going to see a lot of people who really loved working from home during this time. And if they're working for an organization that perhaps doesn't won't allow that as we go back into offices, you may see a lot of self uh, selection, a lot of uh, people deciding to make a move uh, to look for something where they can work from home because they enjoyed it so much. So I, th I think there's going to be a lot of movement uh, here as we approach fall and, uh, and winter, uh, some of it intentional and, and some of it not intentional. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that 100%. And I've seen um, a lot of companies are making, you know, big, bold stances about working from home and saying, yes, you know, work from home until August or, or July of next year, you know, and, yeah. you know, I've seen uh, friends of mine have companies where they've, they've given extra PTO for, for parents with kids to, to right, allow them right. to, to focus on children working remotely. And um, so you see different, different things, but then you also see other companies where they don't allow their, their employees to work from home and they're back in the office now 
and uh, you know, telling people if they have to miss time or quarantine, they need to use PTO. So you see it both yeah. ways. And I think, oh, um, yeah. you know, there's going to be a hard division of where people choose to work based off of the yeah. response. I, I think so. I think, I think that will lead people to make change uh, if they, if they don't have some of that flexibility. And uh, I, I know on, on our podcast, we've explored this, uh, this phenomenon, if you will, with a lot of IT leaders, this, this whole thing about uh, company culture and is culture tied to being in the office or can you extend culture to your remote workers? And that, that's also a challenge for, for leadership. And, and your question about adding value in this time, I think that's where our IT leaders, specifically our tech leaders can add a lot of value is extending that culture into the work from home environment. And how do you make the people that are remote uh, feel a part of a team, even if they're sitting at, in uh, their living room at their, at their house rather than, than in an office. And, and I think that becomes a skill uh, to be able to incorporate people. Uh, and I think we're going to have this hybrid environment. We're going to have some people that come back to the office and we're going to have some people that don't. And, and how do you create team and a feeling of team when you've got that hybrid environment? And I, I think that's where the, the leadership can set themselves apart uh, as we're moving forward into, into uncharted territories for sure. Yeah, for sure. And um, I have to give credit to my wife on this. I think she's probably doing the best job I've seen of anybody doing, uh, you know, building that culture with your team. Um, she's she's hosted, uh, you know, um, happy hours with her team during lockdown, you know, virtual yeah. Zoom happy hours. They do lunch every week together as a team. And then they always talk about like what, where they got their food from or what they made. And, you know, they kind of give awards for who's got the most elaborate, you know, lunch um, yeah. meal yeah. that they're putting together. <laughs> They've done uh, like uh, games where they play like a drawing game, like kind of like win, lose or draw. Um you know, they've celebrated birthday parties all through Zoom and, you know, I've, I've made a big deal about it. And it's just something that, you know, hey, take the kids, get out of here. Yeah. I'm doing my Zoom, you know, my, yeah. my team Zoom Zoom meeting to keep this going. And I think that's you know, great. That's I think, a great I feel like way she's done the it. best I've seen. Yeah. So what are some other tips that leaders can do, you know, when, whenever they are trying to, you know, not uh, 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 forget about their employees that are working remotely, keep them involved? Because <laughs> it's one of those things that happens, you know, out of sight, out of mind, you, you, you kind of yeah. fall into that, that problem. Well, I'd, I'd set a cadence that you're going to check in with your remote workers and do it in such a way that they don't feel like, oh, you're checking up on them, but uh, make it a point to reach out and talk to them and, and ask, how are you doing? Uh, I think that's an important question for, uh, for leaders to ask of their team. And, and I think related to that, John, I think it's important for leaders to ask that of themselves. Uh, we have to have good mental health ourselves in order to lead through chaotic times. And so I think it, it behooves us to check in and ask ourselves how we're doing. Um, we, we, we are all undergoing stress um, and we've had multiple things in 2020 that, that have impacted, uh, whether it's the, 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 the COVID pandemic, whether it's the racial tensions uh, brought about by um, uh, the killing of, of Floyd in May, whatever it is, leaders have had to face multiple challenges and that stress starts to pile up. So I think we have to take a time out and ask ourselves, how am I? And make sure that we're getting the help we need. One of the, one of the th ways to combat stress is uh, connectedness with other people. And the pandemic has taken that away in some regards. So we have to be more intentional about connecting. Um, and so I, I think Zoom calls is, are a great way to do it. WebEx, whatever, whatever platform you're doing, uh, I, I think that has to be an intentional part of it. One of the other things that I've seen that I, that I have found really interesting is in some ways we have connected on a more personal level with each other during the remote work pandemic uh, because we're, we have a window into people's personal lives. 
uh, basically, you know, anytime I'm on a Zoom call, I'm inviting people into my house uh, and they can see the decor of my office. They can, they, they might get interrupted by my six-year-old grandson uh, running in wanting to, wanting to show me something or, you know, on their end of the phone, uh, uh, the call, it might be a dog or a spouse who interrupts the call, but, but it's that personal uh, view that you don't get sitting in an office. So I think we also need to look for the, the quote unquote silver lining in this as well. Yeah, for sure. And there's been a lot of uh, humorous things that I've seen on Zoom calls. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yes, yes. Uh, I, I'm reminded of um, my six-year-old coming downstairs to my wife when she was on a call with probably 30 other people from our tech group. And he just walks up to her and says, mom, you're, you're talking really loud and our two-year-old's trying to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, gosh. oh that's pretty funny that's pre and i'm sure everybody loved it and oh, yeah, no one got yeah. upset with it and yeah yeah so um you have a new book coming out uh about you know job search is that kind of in response yeah. to COVID, or was it something that you were working on and just said hey i think this is the right time well you know it's not the book that i set out to write in 2020 i had actually started uh, kind of a follow-up to Amplify Your Value, which you mentioned earlier, I was writing a book uh, that I was titling Amplify Your Leadership, and it was uh, leadership lessons from unexpected places, if you will. So mm -hmm. leadership comes from all, all ranks uh, in an organization, and so it was unexpected leadership. But I saw what was starting to happen in late February and early March, and I had had this idea for a book. Uh, I've spent the last 10 or 15 years of my career uh, mentoring people that are in transition on their job search. Um, I'd have three or four coffee meetings a week with people and providing them suggestions, insights, making connections for them. So I had this idea in the back of my head for this book. And when I saw what was going to be happening, I, I thought, man, that I, I've got to get this out and get it out in a hurry. So I figuratively put uh, Amplify Your Leadership on the virtual shelf uh, and started hammering out uh, this book, which is called Amplify Your Job Search. And it uh, it comes out on uh, August 24th. I'm sure that this this episode will air after that so it should be available by the time you're hearing this on uh, on Amazon or other online uh, retailers where you buy your buy your books it's going to be uh, it's going to be a ebook version a paperback and uh, an audio version awesome and um, just just a personal question are you recording the audiobook yourself or did you how did you, you go what's the process but I've never <laughs> you know I've been interested well, in, in setting something like that up I, I, I decided to do it myself this time. Uh, mm -hmm. I did not do that for Amplify Your Value. I used a, a great uh, a great guy. His name was Ron Fox. Uh, he's out of Florida, and he and I uh, partnered basically to do Amplify Your Value. So he was the voice uh, behind it. And, you know, there was a lot of people that said, man, I wish, I wish you had done it, Jeff. I wish you had done it. So this time I did. And uh, uh, actually rented time in a recording studio here in Indianapolis by the name of uh, 416 Wabash Recording and worked with a great engineer, Mitch Lohman, and spent, it, it took about seven hours of studio time, I think. Uh, the book itself is about four and a half hours uh, all in. Mm -hmm. uh, but found out I really loved the process. And so we, we did it, we would do our stints because you can't really read much longer than an hour, or at least I can't. Uh, so, you know, we'd, we'd spend an hour in the studio and walk out with 50 minutes or so of the book. Um, and uh, so it was a fun process and uh, I, will, I will absolutely do it again. Awesome. Yeah, I, I'm definitely uh, interested in that. I've I've, I've had a couple of books where I um, hired someone to do the voice and mm. kind of wanted to do it myself, but also I don't want to read what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it wasn't, it, you, you do a lot of public speaking, John. So it mm -hmm. wasn't much different in my mind than that. And uh, I actually found a, a free, a free app. That's like a teleprompter. Uh, and so you can load the text, uh, a text file of your manuscript into it and, 
uh, you can control the speed. And so it's just like reading, like you're reading the news. Um, but if you're used to doing that, which you are, I would, I would suggest trying it. What I, what I did because I was nervous about it was I, I booked an hour of recording time just to go try, uh, and, you know, didn't book anything further. Just, I wanted to try it for an hour and really enjoyed it. Uh, the engineer said it sounded, sounded good. So, uh, I booked uh, I booked the rest of it and we we put it together. So I'd encourage you to find a recording studio. There's lots of companies out there that will help you record an audio book, um, but I found being in a recording studio was was just a first of all it was a fun experience. Uh, you know I'm a I'm a rock star at heart. You know and and uh, uh, being in a recording studio was was a lot of fun. So I, I encourage you to do that and and any of your listeners who uh, are writers and wanting to do an audio book, I would encourage you to go into a studio, rent some time and just see how, see how it goes. Okay. Um, so t tell us a little bit about what this book's about and um, kind of, you know, why you ended up putting this together instead of amplify your leadership. Yeah. So I, I think part of the, part of the issue that I've seen for years is people don't know how to approach a job search. It's not something we typically teach. You might, you know, if you're graduating from university, you might go into career services and, and they help you uh, put together a resume and a, and a strategy. Or if you've been uh, in your career for a while and you're in between jobs, you might go to uh, an outplacement firm or your company may give you outplacement services if it's a reduction in force, but they really don't teach you a process. And, uh, you know, it, you'd be surprised that me being an IT guy like, like yourself, John, we need a process, right? And, and there's, there's a lot of people that just need to know how to, to approach this. So um, what the book does is it lays out a framework and a process and it gives you some tools uh, to use to uh, do a, a little bit of discovery, self-discovery at the beginning. So there's a lot of emphasis on journaling at the beginning of the book um, and understanding who you are and understanding your personal brand. Uh, and then it uh, helps you with listing your accomplishments beyond what you would typically do in a resume. So this, this it goes a little bit deeper. But the focus of the book is really on a professional network. Your, your network is the most valuable resource that you have as a professional. 87% of jobs are filled through networking, 87%. Um, and, and so if you spend the time and build a network and build it intentionally, which is what I, I do in the book is guide you through that process, your likelihood, first of all, your likelihood of, of getting a job is, is far greater, but your likelihood of finding a job that is more rewarding and, and you feel more engaged will makes it possible through your network. So, so the book kind of lays out this framework and I, and I created a set of tools that I guide the, the reader through and to keep with brand because you know, you always have to be branding. I call them amplifiers. Mm. Uh, so you initially start out with creating your personal brand amplifier and then your accomplishment amplifier. Uh, you get into your network amplifier and, and then you get into your um, um, resume amplifier. And then I get into this process because again, there, I was told a good friend of mine back when I was doing a job search told me there's really two ways to approach a job search. There's a, there's a, a shotgun approach and a laser approach. And in a shotgun approach, you're just blasting out your resume to any job that looks like it might be a fit. Uh, whereas a laser approach is more focused. You identify what type of job you're looking for. You identify uh, maybe even the companies that you want to work for. And that's how you target your, your search. And in this economic period, it may seem... Uh, like that's uh, that doesn't make sense. Uh, why would I not give myself the best chance by blasting out my resume? But what you find is if you're in this laser approach, 
and you follow this plan and follow this process, uh, the the jobs that that come your way are much more meaningful. I, I, I the subtitle of the book is strategies for finding your dream job. And, and by that, I don't mean it's going to be your last job. You could have several dream jobs in your career. I know I have. But a dream job to me is a job that is more meaningful. Uh, you you see eye to eye with your boss and you feel very much a part of the organization. And this book lays out that plan on how to do it. And then once you've gone through the first part of the book, it takes you through this strategy for targeting companies specifically and creating almost like a, in, in fact, I use marketing terminology uh, in, in uh, if your audience is familiar with marketing terminology, you have your, your TAM, your target addressable market, and your SAM, your serviceable addressable market, um, and finally your SOM, your share of market. Well, in a job search, you have the same type of thing because what you're driving for, your share of market is your job, the job that you're trying to get. Uh, and so it leads you through that sales funnel almost process of identifying those companies and then how do you target them with your advertising and marketing because guess what? When you're in transition, you're in marketing and sales and the product is you. That's what you're selling and, and having the skills to be able to do that uh, is something that I think people can gain uh, through reading of uh, Amplify, Your, Amplify Your Job Search. So I think with all that I've seen with companies, you know, kind of position themselves to allow people to work from home and kind of being more um, socially responsible, I think. Um, mm -hmm you're going to find more people targeting these companies and saying, I want to work for that company because of, yes. I agree with their stance on, on this or, or what they're exactly. allowing. And, um, so let's say I'm, I'm an employee and I've worked for a company for a few years and now COVID hits uh, and maybe I become unhappy or uh, mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure. And I haven't really built a huge network yet. What are some of the first things I should start doing? Is it jumping on LinkedIn? Is it, uh, you know, trying to find virtual meetups? What should I be doing? That's a great question, and and uh, I'll, I'll add that this book also is great for people who aren't in transition but are feeling exactly what you're describing. Uh, they're not sure where to start. They know they, they want something better. So uh, the same process works, but one of the chapters uh, in the book is actually on how do you start building your network. When I started uh, my job search, this was back uh, several years ago, I think I had 20 connections or something like that on LinkedIn. Um, and so I started reaching out on LinkedIn and connecting with people. Um, so you, you can use a wide variety of, of strategies. It's you, you probably already have a decent network when you stop to think about it. Think about uh, your family, think about your friends, Think about your church. Think about any clubs you belong to. Maybe, maybe you're a, a model train person, so you belong to a model train club or whatever it is, that's your network. Whether you're connected with them on social media or not, that's your network. Start reaching out to those people. Um, in, uh, in the days before COVID, I'd suggest you invite them to a cup of coffee and, and just have a conversation with them. Uh, um, in, in these days, you can still do coffee. I do virtual coffee meetings almost every morning and, and uh, we connect over Zoom and uh, start, start with our coffee and, and have a conversation. Because building the network isn't, a, a lot of people get nervous because they think, gosh, I've got to, uh, I'm meeting John this morning, I've got to ask him for a job. Mm -hmm. No, that's not the approach. I'm meeting John this morning because I want to learn about John. I want to learn about his career. I want to learn about what gets him up in the morning uh, to go to his job. Um, and I also want to, in addition to hearing his story, I want to tell my story. I'm going to do more listening than talking. But in the, in the context of telling my story, then I may ask John, who else should I be talking to? Not, hey, John, do you have a job? Would you hire me? But it's, John, who else should I be talking to? I'm really interested in, uh, in teaching at a college. And I know, John, you do that. So what, who should I be talking to about that? I'd love to learn more about what it's like to do that. 
And so you start having those conversations. It's easier because you're not really asking for a job specifically, especially at the start when you're, uh, when you're um, just building your network. Same thing can happen at uh, if we ever have conferences again. I know, I know, certainly we will. Uh, but when you go to a conference, uh, don't be the fly on the wall. Uh, try to be the person that walks up to others and introduces yourself. Once you get past that initial discomfort, um, it really becomes a lot easier because people love to talk and people love to talk about themselves. A, a, a great icebreaker question uh, is to say, hey, John, tell me your story. How'd you get where you are today? Mm -hmm. Loved, I, I'm fascinated by that. And, and all of a sudden you got somebody talking. Or if you're at a conference uh, or even a virtual conference, if they do breakout rooms, um, ask them why they're there. Why'd you, why'd you come today? What are you, what are you hoping to get out of it? Um, just be armed with two or three questions. That's really all it takes um, and start building your network. But to me, it's, it's not only about finding your job or finding your dream job. It, it's about how much stronger and uh, um, smarter we are. I, I mean, I look at my network today and there are hundreds of people that if I have a question about anything, I can reach out and probably get an answer very, very quickly. That's a huge career boost to have that in your corner, uh, to be able to rely on your network and also contribute to the network. You have things that are of value to others. Your story might be valuable to others. Share your story, share your insights. Uh, and that's how you start to build the network. Awesome. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. I think it's all about not going out asking, hey, are you hiring? Are you hiring? You know, being some yeah, person, yeah. you know, you know it's, it's all about how can you add value? How can you learn about the person? How can you build that connection and, uh, and go from there? I know a lot of, when, whenever I go to a conference, I always, um, always talked about the track in between the sessions. And that, that's kind of my thing is, yes. you know, I'll, I'll never book two sessions back to back. I'll do one yep. session and then the next session is to walk around and talk to people. And I always try to find at least, and I almost make it a game. Like how many people can I talk to that I've never yeah. met before in between these, these two sessions. Yep. And, you know, go, I never eat lunch with people I know. Even if I go to conference with people that I work with, I'm going to go eat lunch with someone different. <laughs> yeah, I want to sit at yeah. some table where I don't know anybody. It's going to be super uncomfortable. And the introvert inside of me is screaming, saying, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this. <laughs> but I always enjoy it when it's all over, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, that, those are great suggestions, uh, John. The, the, the other one that I'll, that I'll throw in there is if you're an introvert and if you're nervous, uh, which a lot of us uh, are, I, I put myself in that same category. Uh, look around the room, look for the wallflowers. Who are the people that are not talking to anybody because they are nervous? Be the one that walks up to them and talks to them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's not as intimidating as trying to join a group of, a, a group conversation. Uh, so yeah, and, and I put a lot of those, uh, those tips in the book about how to, how to break the ice. Yeah, one of the things that I learned a while back is that whenever you're in a lobby, um, never let anybody stand alone. If you see yeah. someone standing alone, your job is to go talk to them. Yep. Yeah. Even if yep. you have people around you that you're talking to, it's time to say, excuse me, break away and go talk to that person because yep. you never know what that person's going through, but also you don't know like what kind of connection you could be missing out on. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, I have a great friend. Uh, his name is Phil Sparks. Uh, I was at a networking event. This was gosh, probably seven or eight years ago. And I was the wallflower man. I just, for whatever reason, I was just really uncomfortable in this room and I was just standing by myself. Uh, and Phil came up and started talking to me. We had a great conversation. We've stayed connected for six or seven years. Um, and it's just been one of those really uh, excellent relationships that never would have happened if he had not walked up to me because I was not going to walk up to him. So, <laughs> so, so try to be that guy. Try to be the guy that walks up with a smile and, a, and uh, uh, in these days, maybe an elbow bump uh, instead of a handshake, but uh, try to be that person. Yeah, for sure. Um, so let's say I, I, I've kind of built up this network over time, maybe over a few months of, of attending meetups and chatting with people that 
you know, through um, LinkedIn or something like that. And I find myself ready to, to update the resume, the good old resume. Mm -hmm. yep. What are some things that I should include on it or maybe do differently so that my resume stands out or it isn't some generic template that you may get from word? That, that, that's a, those are great questions because that, that's sometimes it's more art than science uh, to, to do that. But uh, a couple of the suggestions that, that I have and uh, it, when, you, when you look at a resume, a lot of people uh, include their opening part of their resume is their objective. Um, and the, the problem with an objective statement is it's about you. Uh, not about the person reading the resume. So instead, you should start with um, uh, a professional summary, uh, somewhat, somewhat like your, uh, your about section on LinkedIn, uh, something like that, but more of a summary of what, what you've done and what you've accomplished, because the, 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 the average resume gets read the first pass gets looked at for six seconds. You got to make a heck of an impression in six seconds to get your resume put in the, into the yes pile for a deeper look. And so you start out with that professional summary and put yourself in the mind of the reader. What's in it for them? They have a problem. You are the solution. Let them know that you are the solution to their problem. Uh, and so focus your attention on that, that initial uh, introductory uh, text, that, that, that preface, if you will, to your resume. So that, that would be suggestion number one, uh, is, is to do that. Um, so some other things, some other best practices, um, as you go through the different sections, um, identify accomplishments that are going to resonate with the reader. You may you may think, oh man, this this accomplishment that I that I did for uh, X Y Z company is great. It may not mean anything to the reader. So again, put yourself in, in the mind of the reader as you're doing it. And, and the other thing that I would suggest, and and I talk about this in the book, is you're going to have more than one resume. Um, you're you're going to have at least four types of resumes. You're going to have um, LinkedIn because LinkedIn is a resume. In fact, it's probably the first resume uh, talent acquisition professionals going to going to see. So treat it like your resume. Uh, you're going to have a, a bio resume, which is more. Uh, think, John. You, I know you speak at conferences. Think of your bio that you that you provide to the conference that tells a little bit about you. As a job seeker, I want a bio resume to send to the people that I'm meeting for the first time. Uh, so write a bio type resume, which is a little more narrative uh, and less bullet point ish. Then you're going to have a general resume, which is the resume that you're sending out when you know very little about the job or the company to which you're applying. So think you found a job online, you don't know a lot about it other than what you can read and you're going to submit your resume. That's your general resume. The fourth type is a targeted resume. And what you're going to do, you're going to take your general resume and then you're going to target it at the company that you're applying to. So do some research, find out as much as you can about the role, find out as much as you can about the company and update your resume to reflect the language that they're using. You're not, it's not a work of fiction. You're not making up accomplishments. You're not making up skills that you have, but if, if they are talking about specific skills and requirements for that job, make sure your resume has those in there. Um, if they call, uh, one of the examples I, I put in the book is about if you're in HR and you're wanting to be the head of an HR department, uh, you might find job descriptions for VP of HR. You might find uh, uh, chief people officer. You might find director of HR, whatever it is, uh, and you're applying for that job, make sure that you use those same words mm -hmm. in your resume. That's going to do a couple of things. Uh, one is most companies today use some sort of applicant tracking system. 
and those applicant tracking systems have algorithms that they're scoring your resume on so that when the talent acquisition professional says hey let me pull out the first the the top 10 applicants for this job it pulls out the top 10s that are scored well a lot of that scoring is based on keywords uh, and so you want to make sure you're using the same words that they used in their job description because that's probably how the the applicant tracking system is scoring it the other advantage that it does is when you are when it is being read by human those keywords are going to jump out to them off, off the paper to them mm -hmm. uh, as they're reading through the resume so those are just some of the some of the tips uh, that that uh, are meaningful and I, I know your audience is uh, more than just IT leaders but if you're in a tech role whether it's uh, whether it's engineering whether it's uh, uh, information technology the other thing that I'll add is on your general resume is have a skills addendum uh, a, a, an attachment that just lists three columns single spaced every skill that you can think of that you have um, and uh, because again you're trying to get a high score in the applicant tracking system and that's one of the ways that you can achieve that yeah, for sure. Um, one of the things that I want to throw out there just because, you know, in, in hiring recently, I've been looking at some resumes too. And, uh, and I think you, you've hit on this already that you want your resume to be specific to the, the, the company or to the job. And mm -hmm. one of the things that some people may forget that I've seen is the, um, the title of their resume. You know, yeah. like the, the actual document that they save it as, whatever the PDF file or, or Word document it is, you know, don't have it just be like generic resume, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. I think, it's, I think it's really cool when I see one of them that has like my company name. You know? Exactly. Because I know they took the time to actually create a new version for this particular job. And that's, yeah. that's, that's important to me. And also when they mention the company, like maybe in their objective or some part of their resume, they talk about how they can bring value to you. Yeah, I think that is a great a suggestion, John. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the other thing is, while you're thinking about the way things are titled, look at your email address. Um, you know, uh, cute email addresses are just that. They're cute. They, they don't really scream professionalism. Uh, so uh, if you need to create a, a new email address uh, because you really love uh, uh, rock and roll scarecrow at gmail.com, um, you, you know, create a new email address as jeff.tun at gmail.com. Uh, again, you want everything to be targeted at the company you're going towards. Yeah, for sure. Um, another thing that I think is important is to look at the, uh, the font that you're using and make sure it's mm -hmm. consistent. Make sure it's, you know, a, a pe a pe appealing. I, I've seen some yeah. people, I've actually gotten resumes where, um, they used, you know, Times New Roman as the top part of their font, and then it goes to Helvetica, and then it switches <laughs> to Arial later down. And it's like you copied and pasted stuff, and you didn't even correct the font afterwards. You know, yeah, yeah. It may seem petty, it may, but honestly, you want someone that presents this position. They're going to present, you know, they're speaking for your company. They're speaking for you Absolutely. and your your job, and you want them to when they're creating reports. I want them to take the extra time and care. And if they're not doing that for themselves, why would I think they would do that for me? Absolutely. That, that's a great point as well is, and, and don't, e even within a single typeface or, or font, don't change uh, sizes very often. Don't, don't, uh, you, you just want it consistent uh, throughout the, throughout the resume because you want it easy to read and having font changes or having style changes within the resume makes it harder to read. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, it's another thing it's when you look at them and it's just like, it, I, sometimes I only, and you know, pe people I've gotten, are, how do I, um, I've worked, people that I've worked with before when I'm looking at job resumes, I was like, I didn't even read that far down there because I couldn't get past the fact that their fonts were ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, yeah. well, you know, shouldn't you have given them the, the opportunity? I said, no, because if no, they can't get the no. fonts right, I, I'm, yeah, it's an automatic yeah. rejection. It doesn't matter. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Content. Same thing yeah. with typos and misspellings, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a death knell for a resume. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I, I agree with you 100% on the networking side. And I think these are all good tips that people can have. And one of the things that I've, uh, you know, been kind of encouraged going through this COVID thing is that there's been a lot of people that have been, um, you know, at least for me, they've been reaching out through uh, social media and through, um, 
you know, other means when they can't get, you know, talk to you personally, they've been sending me, Mm -hmm. you know, information and messages and and keeping in touch. And I think that's a really, you know, good thing for people to do. And um, I I think COVID kind of gives people an excuse to do that, you know, reconnect some of these connections that you haven't had before, check on people, see how people are doing. And um, it's a great opportunity for people out there that may not have a very strong online or digital network to to kind of grow that. There, there's a there's a great community on on LinkedIn. If you if you go to LinkedIn and and type in the hashtag uh, hashtag get hired all one word, there's a there's a huge community of people that are uh, wanting to help uh, you in your search and people that are in their search uh, that are posting things on there. And uh, again, we we talked earlier in the program about the connectedness and the way that uh, you one of the ways that you deal with stress is to be connected with people. There's no more stressful time in a person's life than when they're in transition from work. Uh, so connect with people, uh, even for the sake of having that community to know that you're not alone in your job search. Yeah, for sure. I think that's uh, super important to do. And, you know, understand that you know people are going through different things right now some people have sick loved ones some people have you know yeah. kids that are at home driving them crazy and some people are actually really enjoying this time of slow down and reevaluate and are, are, are relaxing and having a good time so just realize yeah. that people are all over the spectrum right now and try to have a little bit more empathy and uh, put yourself in whatever situation that people are going through yep, yep. very true so how can people find out more about um you know so the things that you're doing, connect with you, um, and maybe check out this book. Um, how, how can people do that? Well, uh, my website is uh, www.jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y, S-T-U-N, T-O-N, dot com. So www.jeffreys.com. You can uh, get in touch with me there. I'm also on LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, my uh, my moniker on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram is Jton Indy, uh, I N D Y. So J T O N I N D Y. Would love to connect. Uh, and, and the other thing I've done, John, for your for your audience is I've created a landing page at uh, JeffreySton.com. If you go to JeffreySton.com slash a geek leader. Um, I've got a free download for you of the personal brand amplifier, one of the tools from the book. Uh, And if you download that amplifier, it will give you a a nice discount on a copy of the book uh, if you're interested after, uh, after checking that out. So I encourage your, your listeners to go there and reach out. Would love to connect uh, on LinkedIn or email and, uh, and hear your story about your transition. Yeah, awesome. And I'll link that up in the show notes as well so people can find that at geekleader.com and uh, can can link over to to download that brand amplifier and get the discount on the book. So, uh, Jeff, thanks for coming back on the show. Really appreciate it. Always good to connect and talk with you. I'm glad that uh, you guys are doing well. My pleasure, John, and thank you so much for having me on the program again. I really appreciate it. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed that episode, please share it on uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever you share your content. And don't forget to head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review. I'd greatly appreciate that. And if you want to find out more about Rust, don't forget there is a free one-day conference, September 15th. Go to geekleader.com slash Rust. Again, geekleader.com slash R-U-S-T, Rust, for more information. Again, geekleader.com slash Rust.